welcome to the Naked Podcaster. Get ready to hear stories of someone brave enough to bear it all. Let's get naked. Welcome to the Naked Podcaster. Today I am on with Dr. Fujian Zane, who was a past guest and now I get coaching and I'm so excited to see you. How are you? I'm doing great. It is so nice to see you and I see that you're naked and it's yeah. beautiful for now. Thanks. <laughs> Well, I mean, you came on, I was like, God, you look great. You look awesome. And you're like, you're naked. Yes, we're both awesome. <laughs> Absolutely. Tell me, jump, let's jump in because you've been a guest before and I'm going to link that initial podcast because your story is absolutely amazing. And you took your story and created this amazing life and business. So jump into who you are in your entrepreneurial life and what you do. You have a lot that you do that I think is exciting and I, lo and I love. Thank you. Um, I've been a therapist and a coach for um, close to 30 years, 29, 30 years. And um, I came an immigrant, so I came uh, to the United States when I was 12. I kind of like raised myself and mm -hmm. um, I've gone through a lot of trauma. So I went to um, a lot of the self, uh, you know, progress seminars and um, done a lot of therapy. And I fell in love with growth, you know, how it impacted me, how it soothed my trauma and how I could you know, learn everything that was out there and bring it to people who needed it. So I also developed um, a model, which is called the Awareness Integration Model. And I wrote a book, uh, a self-help book called uh, Life Reset, the Awareness Integration Path to Creating the Life You Want. And it's uh, bringing a lot of the different techniques and theories in the psychotherapy world from cognitive behavior, emotional, behavioral, existential, um, you know, trauma-based and, and body-based, and brought it together into doing like very deep work in a very short time. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I'm writing the second book, which is actually dealing with um, learn, uh, teaching therapists and coaches in how to do this in a deeper level. So I'm uh, you know, finishing up that book and I'm excited. I also do a lot of radio and television mm -hmm. in both languages, in Farsi and English. I have a show that you were my guest. Uh, that's, yes. Yes, KMET uh, 1490 AM, which is an ABC radio. Mm -hmm. And... Um, I'm loving it. I'm loving uh, being with people and having the honor of being part of their life and working together for betterment of all of us. I know when we first connected and I, I try to follow all of my guests, but I really get connected with some more than others. And so I cyber stalk you like crazy, you know, and I see your post and all of a sudden I'm like, yep, that's Farsi. Cause I absolutely cannot read it. And I'm always like, yay, look at you. I mean, it's, it's, you're doing some really amazing, exciting things different than traditional talk therapy. You really took it in a different way that I think is so exciting and helpful to people. Thank you. So one of the conversations uh, that showed up for me is that I want people to be responsible and accountable for um, their perception and things that they're doing and the behavior. And um, I know I came from a lot of trauma many, 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 many years in my life. I was depressed. I was anxious. And I felt that I was a victim. And that truly didn't work for me. Um, and I wanted to be out of that. And I needed to know how I could be out of that, which would be responsible and it would be um, honorable to me. And, you know, it wasn't like snap out of it, da, 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 da. It was more like being honorable, you know, that yeah. um, I could see who I was. And then, you know, based on my clients and who they are um, to honor where they are, but not take a victimized stance at something and really look at what it is that I have, what are my strengths and, you know, finding those strengths and then, if completing the past, because if you don't complete the past, you know, they're kind of like they linger constantly and in many ways sabotage us. Um, and then, you know, kind of create the future that we could, uh, that calls us forward, that we could kind of like walk into and, and move forward and uh, live in the present moment, because that's pretty much where you could do some action in that matters. Um, so that's kind of in a nutshell. And then the other side of it, um, Jen, is uh, that we're always in a relationship. Always, like you're either a relationship with the world and either you're in an assumptive relationship and how the world is with you. Mm -hmm. um, and then you take yourself everywhere. So your relatedness to yourself, which builds your self-esteem and self-confidence is always, you know, carrying you and building your future. So kind of, I've 
brought it into those three perspectives. And as we work together today, you'll be uh, more familiar with how we take these three things. And then based on this, um, we find our dualities, you know, the different parts of us which have different kind of thought process mm -hmm. and emotions, but they kind of like run side by side. And um, also if there's a negative core belief that is there, we'll kind of like pick it and then we'll drill together and go where it showed up, how did it show up, you know, how is it there, kind of try to reintegrate it and then come back and kind of build a future uh, in that area of life. In a normal level, um, when somebody comes to me, we go in every single area of their life that matters. So we can kind of like clean up, sweep, and yeah. then create, create a whole new level of a stance and a mission statement and a purpose for that person as they're going forward. Plus that when you go through this in every single area, you really uh, learn the skills and built it in yourself because you get to practice in all the different areas. But today, uh, together, let's, uh, let's pick one area that, or like two areas that are connected to each other, and we can kind of like jump in and work together for those two areas. Yeah, I love it. So, uh, yes, and I think that's a great thing for people to know that, you know, this isn't a one and done. <laughs> I wish. <laughs> It does take time and there are lots of areas and a lot of things are connected. What I do love and I want to shout this out is that, I mean, first of all, you, you've, ha you have your, um, doctorate in therapy. You like, you have so much incredible training, but I love that you take a holistic approach and that you take time and that you want to do it in a way that I feel is respectful. And I love when you said a future that calls us forward, I, the, I was like, Oh, <gasps> Oh, okay. Yes. So I'm really excited. Let's, we can just jump in. Me too. Let's yeah. jump in. So pick an area that is most important for you, for us to um, check in with that mm -hmm. right now you, you would like for us to work on. I'm going to go with money and career. I think that's the one that I, I don't know. Sometimes I feel stuck on or what I love about you is facil facilitating this is that I don't know what I don't know. I don't understand what is stuck in me. So trying to navigate out of it is like a hamster wheel. I'm just going nowhere fast. So I'd say money and career. Okay. So let's look at, uh, so I'll take the bigger picture of the career first and within it, I, I will ask about money. Is that okay? okay. Yeah, absolutely. Because I'm assuming that your source of money will come from your career. Correct. So then we'll take the bigger picture of that. Okay. Yes. So tell me about your thoughts uh, about your career. So let's also look at the distinction, different, the distinct difference between thoughts and emotions, right? So your thoughts would be, um, the way you think about your career and um, the way you would think about people in your career uh, who would be, um, in, you know, kind of like dealing with in your career. And um, they're different than emotions because the emo when I ask you about the emotions, then the emotions will usually come in in one word concept and we'll deal with it as we go. I just want you okay. to have a distinction because we're going to distinguish between your thoughts, your emotions, and your behavior. Now, at the beginning, you might hear me say, that's an emotion, that's a behavior. But part of the reason I'm doing that is also training the mind in having the distinction between these three mm -hmm. because... Because when you have a distinction, when something goes wrong, you can know which one of these parts you would need to have a shift in. Got it. You know, like if you have a plumbing problem, you really want to know what is the issue and which part you need to shift. And when you have some, you know, something go, like you, the result isn't the result you want, we want to know what part we need to shift. Is it our thoughts we need to shift? Is it our emotion that is there we need to handle? Is it our behavior we need to change in order to create that? So part of that is learning how to distinguish these three. And then as we're going, you might hear me say, that's a thought, thank you. And that's an emotion, that's a behavior. So I don't want it to feel like I'm correcting you. I want you to capture, I'm teaching you distinctions. So Got just it. pick it up and move on to the next one. Does that make sense? Yes. Beautiful. Yes, yes. Tell me your thought process about your career what it is, what my career is. Um, it is working with other moms. I'm mom of 18 kids with 28 years experience. And it's working with other moms that are feeling overwhelmed and helping them get to a place that is out of overwhelm. Okay. 
And when you say this is your business, how does that uh, structure? Is it a coaching business? Um, what type of a business is it? Coaching program, workshop, uh, speaking. I, and I love speaking. It's, um, it's great to talk to many people at once. It's less personal. So I, I love doing it. I love the speaking part of it and webinars. Um, I love the coaching because it's more intimate. And so I get to know the person better. Um, and my, and everything I do is helping them stay out of an emergency room type of thought process and more into a preventative medicine thought process to reduce stress and conflict in their lives. Got it. Um, and what are some of the positive concepts that you have about your career? Positive thought process, positive belief systems, your strength when you think about it when it comes to your career. Um, increasing gratitude in other people. I mean, that's so huge. You, you know, um, also, I think that one person made such a huge impact in me. It's a matter of paying that forward in other people's lives in the way that I'm good at, which is definitely that preventative medicine, increasing gratitude and joy you know, helping those mamas feel as kick-ass as I know they are. And uh, when you think about the positive notions, what are the positive concepts that you also have around money uh, with your career? <laughs> well, I don't know that I do have it. I mean, I love the thought of taking something that I know that I'm skilled at and actually getting paid for that, earning money from that, that makes me super happy. So not only am I doing something that I love, that I'm passionate about, uh, that I'm good at, that I have a lot of experience with, but it also it pays my electricity and wouldn't that be awesome if we could do all of those things together? Yes, definitely. Yeah. To have the, both, uh, both of the good together. Yes. What, what are some of the negative thought process that shows up for you regarding your career and, and money? I was the, I was raised below poverty. So I know that how that feels, how you can feel trapped or embarrassed or shame from it. I've been um, in a position where I had money. I had someone cleaning my house and doing all those things. Um, and then I've been the single mom. I've blended families. I've struggled in all of those. You know, I've lost a child. I miscarried children. I, I've been through kind of the gamut of the parenting with money, without money. And so where I know I get stuck is wanting to help moms who can't afford to get the help. Because I was the mom that applied for every scholarship back 10 years ago. I was a mom that was working three jobs and feeling like I was doing not a good enough job at anything. Work wanted more, kids wanted more. I had no identity because I was so stretched so thin and because I felt those spaces of time in my life. I don't want that to stop someone. So that's where I struggle with charging money. Yes, but there's all these people that need help that are in it. So to work around that, my thought was I can offer a scholarship anytime I want. Beautiful. Because it really makes it hard to me to think that I could help someone. And the reason that I'm not is because they're that mom where I was at feeling alone and afraid and overwhelmed and wanting to reach out and being humiliated, embarrassed, feeling shame and guilt. And I, I, I those are the moms I want to help the most mm. for the podcast. It's like, Oh, you want to have a celebrity on an interview? Yeah. But like at, everybody hears from them. My whole thing was what about that little person that no one knows about who's got just as impactful or more impactful a story, but they're unknown. And so I don't get as much, I don't get as much from that as the celebrity interview, but I'm helping, I'm getting a story out that feels better. That's more genuine. That's less known. So it's that balance between for me, I think, helping the women that are really in that space, but still getting paid for what I do. 
Right. And that's the duality that you're facing. That is definitely, I, I struggle so much with that. Like I have no problem charging and knowing that I'm an expert in a certain thing and putting this information out and they're helping. I, I have no issue with that. Right up until I think about that mom who's like, yes, and then clicks on the program and sees a cost and it stopped me from doing it. Right. So how do you behave actually toward your career? What are some of the actions that you're doing toward your career that are positive or negative? A negative one that I do is saying, well, I can't start that program because I don't know how to launch it. Because I know the second I get stuck in how to do something, I'm in my head and it's another one of my hamster wheels and I've got to learn it and I've got to learn the IT and I've got to learn the program and which I just get down that whole train. So I'm not thinking about the actual program or the offering or the class it's I'm caught up in all of the other stuff that that maybe you need to know but that's where I go because that's a comfortable place for me so that's a negative thing so then I do nothing I don't launch it I don't offer it because I'm stuck in the learning the steps how to do it um positive things are that I have the I have a nine-week course written out I've had a beta, beta client go through the course and give feedback. I've done the workshop. I started speaking for free locally. I, I took a couple of years off because I just, because it was, my career was taking a negative spin. It was, I was being asked to speak about conflict resolution and stress reduction. It was very ER and not preventative medicine. And I realized, well, I'm saying yes, and I'm doing this, but it's really not where my heart is at. So I took a break and I regrouped, which was wonderful. Um, so that I could do it exactly from the space that I wanted to do it in. So that was a very positive thing. One, saying yes, two, taking a break, and three, realizing through that what was really important. Um, and then, like I said, I have it laid out. And I also hired a coach that does the keywords, the SEO, the hashtag, and designs the coaching program. Like I don't have, I'll, I don't have to ask how. I just have to say, this is the next thing I want to do. And she'll let, well, we'll do that together. Right. So I've eliminated my ability to hide under a rock because it's uncomfortable for me. Got it. So I'm going to go back to your feelings now and want okay. you to think of, think about your um, work, visualize yourself at work. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now tell me the positive emotions that show up for you connection, mm -hmm. collaboration, um, compassion, mm -hmm. you know, really seeing and feeling that person, seeing them, really seeing them and making a difference. Um, my whole platform is based on compound interest. It's doing small things over time that make a big difference. And so seeing myself do those small things over time that are making a bigger difference, that is like, my tear filled happy place. I mean, my number one place that I would want to speak and do workshops are women's retreats. And I know that I know that that's where I want to be. I want to be with women who are ready to make a difference, who are showing up, who have gotten rid of distractions and are hungry and feeding that in the way that I can and being connected to that. And that is the, I, I don't think there are words that I have that I can describe helping somebody get on the other side of that because I've been on both sides. Yeah. So making that faster, easier, and more supported for them than maybe it was for me. And God, that that's a happy place. That's an overwhelming happy place. Beautiful. And as you check in with you being in your career, mm -hmm. what would be some negative emotions that will show up for you? Um, Maybe if I wasn't able to help someone or someone didn't resonate with me, um, which happens, I don't take that super personally, but that would, because you, just like you, you know, you want to help the person that's standing in front of you and to not be able to do that would be super tough for me. Um, I immediately think of resources though, because I can't be everything to everyone. So instantly it's like, well. Who that's your behavior. So if okay. you're with the emotion. Yep. What would be the emotion that will show up when you think, when you think I can't help someone, what kind of an emotion shows up for you? Sadness and disappointment, probably. Um, yeah. Like I didn't, yeah. And with the way that you're thinking, you know, that I'm going to be there for women 
uh, to find themselves to not be overwhelmed to um, you know have have their stress in a way that is manages and they can you know help themselves and grow and then help their own children and um, the way that you feel in the connection the collaboration the compassion the love and the happiness and the joy and uh, putting it all together in the form of coaching when you're one-on-one -on -one and intimate or in the, you know, speaking with a lot of people, which you reach, you know, a lot of people out there. And um, with the way that you also think that you're putting yourself out there, you might be not knowing the know-how, but you're also finding the way to do it. With this way of thinking, feeling, and behaving, what is the impact that you're having in your own life and other people's life this way? by how I'm doing it now, I'm having zero. And it's so frustrating. So although you're having all of this, you're having zero impact in everybody else's life, but you do have an impact in your own life. What is the impact that you have with this way of thinking, feeling and, and acting and behaving? What is the impact on your life? Seems like it hasn't really gone out yet to, to have an impact out there, but you right. do have an impact here first. What is that? the positive part of it is that I live what I teach. So I am so grateful. I come from a place where I feel all of, all of what I teach. I, I understand it. I, I have lived it for 25 plus years. And so it impacts my life greatly every single day. I have all that happiness. And you know, then there are conflicts and stress where I feel disappointed or that I could have done better. And so all of those things, I feel all of those things myself to one degree or another. Um, yeah, I, I live it. I live what I'm telling people. So I, so impact, I have that. And the impact is, it's definitely making you happy. Yes. Oh, yes. And it's making your personal life much better because when you live that happiness and you bring that type of a stress-free and not overwhelmed and supporting and helping and respecting yourself, you know, it affects you with your own relationship and your children and everyone around you. The negative impact as I'm hearing you is it's not, it's not fulfilling the purpose of a career and a business and a financial piece yet. So it's not really impacting right. the mass group of women that you really want to impact. And right. uh, the business is not going forward. Right. And it is on a small level because I've done a beta test and I do have people around me. So I have spoken quite a few times in the last six months. Um, I, because I knew everyone from doing it before and I, this is a great community where I, we're only like 300,000 people in Reno where I live. So I immediately, once I knew how I wanted to move things forward, I jumped out and I spoke several times now because as we're filming, we're in the middle of COVID right now. So I, uh, I'm, I have a virtual, um, conference in May and one in June. So I pivoted that easily. So it's not that I'm not getting word out there and making a difference but it's not making that jump to where it's a business that's sustaining me financially or that I have the courses and programs done in a bigger way I'm it's I'm thankful that I'm doing it the, the amount I've done that I've done right but I haven't taken the next steps so I want you to be aware of the first time I asked you your your word to me was nothing no yeah. Okay. Got it. Okay. Right. Yes, I do. All right. <laughs> and then I just gave you a list. <laughs> yes. Yes. Okay. So I, so I uh, good, I, uh, beautiful. I okay. want, I want you to pat yourself on the back. <laughs> okay. Thank back. you. Okay. Yes. It wasn't nothing. Right. Yeah. Okay. Because right. if you are creating accomplishments, it's important for you to value it. I, that's part of what I tell people. So yes, you are correct. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So that's a great value. Now, I, I want you to imagine some of the women who, would, who have been working with you or will be working with you. What is your assumption about how they will think of you and your business? Oh, um, I don't think I've ever... Well, I worry because of comments that when I say I'm mom of 18, the comments I get back are, oh, well, I only have one or I only have three. So what I don't want them to think is that somehow 
I'm at a different level than they are. I've had different experiences um, that they can't have conversations with me because they only have X kids. Um, so I don't, uh, I, I feel very in the trenches and I want them to perceive me as in the trenches, not as some elevated status. I genuinely have had more children and more years to fail and figure it out and, and design how I work through conflict and stress with more gratitude. And so my concern is that that's what the first say is how they perceive me. Oh, well, I only have an instantly they feel, I don't know if it's less than, I don't want to make that assumption, but that it's not a competition. I always say, that's great. It's not a competition. I have one book. My friend has 17. We're still authors. We have the same title. So regardless of the amount of kids you have, you're still called a parent and those stresses are not less or more. They're different. And my situation was different. So I don't want them to perceive me that way. Um, I don't want to be perceived as like all knowing and I have all the answers because I have these answers that worked well for me that could work well for them. Um, there's no magic one to fix something, but there are steps that you can take to help with that. So yeah, I think I have more concerns. I don't know how people see me. I know. So I want to ask you, okay. Um, I would like you to guess positive assumptions that you would have about people seeing you in a positive light also because your brain automatically just to notice yep your brain automatically went into the negative part right. of your worry right yeah so um, i would like to balance it off with also asking you if you could really assume okay yes um one is that i'm successful which means a lot of different things to a lot of different people and I had to learn that it doesn't always mean a bank number, an account, <laughs> the amount of money in your bank, that I'm successful, that I'm a good parent, that I've done a great job, um, and that I kind of have my shit together in, in a lot of ways, in this way. Um, and then I learned to take negative situations in my life and find the silver lining. Yeah. So that's definitely, yeah. How do you assume people feel about you? How do Mothers I assume? Or the people who are going to be working with you. How do you assume they will feel about you? Positive and negative. Um, one that I think I'm on some pedestal because I've had so many kids and so much time. And the other. Like admire you, adore you, admiration. Mm, no, more. It's more of a competitive thing, I think. Because when they say, oh, I can't talk to you, I only have one, like it's not a competition. We're not competing over who has the hardest knocks or whose kid's would the be, worst or who's. So the feeling would be like, would be intimidated by you? Yeah. Think? Okay. That's a great word. Yes. Yes. Um, yeah. And the positive is that they get that I just love them and want to give them everything I've got. So they like feel I, safe and they I feel... get you. Okay. They feel seen. Seen. Okay seen they feel seen yes so on a behavioral level how do you either assume or observe um that people you work with um kind of behave towards you um i haven't had much negative except in those that initial comment that oh i only have this many kids because the first once um they know who i am and that i have 18 kids all of a sudden that is a little it's intimidating for me <laughs> they're my kids and i'm intimidated but you know um the behavior is that they kind of sometimes close off because they feel like that's an intimidating number um but i think if they had conversations with me before they found that out, which is my favorite way to set it up. I want somebody to get to know me before they know that piece. Um, and that they know what my, what I, my goal is, then I hug a lot. I hug a lot. <laughs> so I think that there's an initial reservation and then a warmth because I, um, 
and I hope that's how I approach it when they say, oh my gosh, I only have three kids. And I'm like, it's not a competition. We were both parents on time one and we've both been parents and I've just had more opportunity to screw it up and figure it out. That's it. Like that's the difference. And so I try to bridge that gap really quickly. Like I see you mama. I get it. I, I know where you're at. So yeah. How do you assume other people think of you when it comes into the area of finances and money? I have no idea, but I know I've had a couple people who have said to me recently, it's great to see a woman who's so successful, that statement. And I know that I have an issue with that statement because I, and I just say, oh, thank you. But I don't know what that means to them. I know to me, it means bank account. And that's my disconnect in that. And they could be saying, I don't know, I talked to their daughter and it was happy or we had a play day. Or, you know, I, it could be a million different things, but I think I'm so afraid that, that they see me as successful financially. And then I have to like, what, admit my bank account or something? Like, I don't know. It's a silly conversation. Feels like or you're fear. Maybe, yeah, that I'm not actually successful like they think I'm successful. So I don't ask them what they mean because I'm afraid to know the answer. Damn it, Pujan. Jeez. <laughs> yes, that's it. That's so uncomfortable. Yeah, that's, I don't have imposter sy syndrome in what I do. That's where I have imposter syndrome. Got it. So how do you assume they feel about you on a financial level? I have no idea positive negative guess based on what you assume um that i it's been a struggle because we have so many kids i mean finance comes up in that regard like how did you feed them all how could you what was your food bill is a that is one of the top questions i get asked it was more than my mortgage so you know yeah. How did you do that? It was a lot of prioritizing and cutting back other things. I mean, it was that they were our priority. So feeding them was part of that and it was expensive. So maybe a lot of curiosity, curiosity and that I'm pretty creative actually, probably. Yeah. Because when I hear myself answer that, that is the number one thing. Like how, how did you fit them in? How did you afford them? How, how did you do it? And it, I am scrappy. My best friend calls me scrappy. And I am creative in managing money where it may seem like there isn't a lot or the money part is fine, but the volume is huge, you know, of kids is huge. So it doesn't matter. However, you have to balance it out. I'm actually pretty creative at that, which is, I believe that I am. So I think that that's probably how they'd see me. Uh, yeah. And whether they think that that's a... Go the more I hear you, I have, I get this sense so that when you come to public, um, you get this concept of people looking at you and saying, wow. And then sometimes this, wow, it's out of curiosity and you feel like you have to answer. Sometimes the wow, it's almost like an intimidation as if they're, the wow comes in and puts you into a position where then with your wordings, Jen, you keep trying to bring down the pedestal and say, no, 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 I belong to you. We're the same. Don't worry about it. Uh, don't put me anywhere else. I'm one of you. Right. Uh, and I sense this struggle where you are putting yourself out there, which you've done amazing things and you want to share those amazing things, but somehow you're also afraid of being put into a space of amazing person or done amazing thing because the moment that there is some sort of a assumption of people coming to you, you downgrade it and pedal back constantly. Okay. Am I accurate? Yeah, I think you are, which is super interesting. I don't want people to think I'm better than them, I guess. Yeah. And so I constantly downgrade myself yeah. so that they don't. Um, because I don't want to be unapproachable and I don't want people to think I don't understand where they're at. Yeah. I, so I, I really struggle with that success notion. Yeah. And then you put me on stage and you never guess that. But the second I'd have a conversation afterwards, I'd be downgrading myself. Well, the stage is a role you're playing. 
But when we yeah. see you and uh, there's a personal experience, you want like, I want to come down from the pedestal and I want to be with you and I don't want you to put me up there. I want to be one with you. And then, but there's a struggle for you to do that. And through the struggle, your wordings toward yourself becomes <clears throat> de de demeaning or okay. you know, making yourself small. Right. And then there's this confusion when there's a grandness and then you push the button and you want to become small and then okay. you want to be, you go back into grandness. And I think there's a confusion there. And then, um, and again, where, whatever I'm giving you as a feedback, as a mirror of what I hear from you, mm -hmm. if it doesn't fit for you, you tell me, because I'm just kind of picking up what, what I hear from you and kind of reflecting it back. So any of it, if it doesn't fit for you, you tell me because you help me gear toward the accurate place. Oh, I think you're a hundred percent accurate. And I think that that's why I keep getting ready or putting something out there. And then I dial it back. I think yeah. it's shocking and sad to me. And I think it's spot on. Great. So now when you think about your, you, you in your career and you with your, with the, uh, I won't even say women, just people, okay. um, that you're either doing close coaching or, you know, on the screen or um, presenting. When you look at you, when you look at Jen, what do you think about you? Positive or negative? I think I'm a badass and I'm not afraid. Um, Cause a lot of people are afraid to be on the stage. Um, and I say that after you just told me what you told me, but there's a huge part of me that has no fear at all. And the fear, the fear is, is you, you have no fear of survival. Yeah. It's very different than fear of being grand. That's true. So that's a tough comment to swallow because it's very true. I'm really good at survival. Um, amazingly good at survival. So th that's like my safe place, I would think then. Oh, shit. That's why it seems like you'll come, you'll survive, you'll come right over here. And then the minute you get comfortable, you go get another kid and survive and come over here. And then right when you're fine and you go back another day to get, you know, and you, and you, your business has been, prior to now, your business has been to take, and I'm going to be emotional right now too. Okay. Your business has been to take children who need a place to survive from love, with love. Yep. And that's what you've done. Yeah. That's what you're amazing at. Mm -hmm. You just don't know how to live in a grand place. True. But you are a master at surviving and bringing other people from survival to living. Yeah, that's true. Thank you for... And when I did it with the kids and loved it, I mean, if you ask me, you are a great mom. Yes, I, I was, I am. How were you? Because I chose it and I loved it. And that went a long way into being really good at it. And then I looked around at all the moms and I was like, oh God, like I'm done with my kids. You know, I was done taking in kids and that had kind of wrapped up. And I looked around the moms and I was like, how do I never see them there? Like I learned how to do this so well. I was so good at it. They need me. The kids are good now, but they need me, but I want to do more than just take one in and help them to survive and get to a certain level. Yes. And you want, you want to make other parents be the parent who can create this over and over and over again. Right. And I get that. And I get it that you're ready, but you're right. I'm super, God, I'm so good at survival. I'm so good at survival and it's not where I want to live. It's hard right. and it's unfulfilling right. and it doesn't help those other people. So I don't know how to not, when someone says something to not diminish myself because I don't want, I still don't want 
if I'm on that pedestal, I don't want them to feel like they can't come to me or I don't see them or I'm not approachable. I mean, that is the fear there in that separation. I and, know that I, yeah. And maybe there is a way to be grand and not be on a pedestal. Yeah. Maybe there's a way to be grand and connected at the same time and belong at the same time. And, and that's, that's a vision, if you like, to acquire or any a vision that's close to that. So it's not all or nothing or this yes. or black or white, that it encompasses the, the, uh, the aspects that you actually want right. together. You know? right. And we can figure out the vision on that later. Okay. Now, when you think of yourself in the area of money, mm -hmm. what do you think of Jen when it comes to money? Um, I'm not certain I'm deserving. Mm -hmm. Or if I have it, I I've had it before. Um, I feel like having money separates people. That's a belief of mine. And I don't like some of what I see when people have money and separate themselves in a financial class. And I'm not living below poverty and I haven't for a lot, a lot, a lot of years. So it was okay for me to go up to a certain level. It's the, but it's that survival mentality again. You know, I got myself to here and, and there's nothing wrong I wanted to raise my kids in a house. I was a single mom for a lot of years. I worked really hard to provide for them. It would have been easier to be in an apartment or in a mobile home or a trailer park. And I wanted my kids to grow up in a home in the backyard with our dog. And they did. They did. I provided those things. So I decided I don't want to live below whatever in my mind. And I never did. But I don't know how to break through that barrier or what that money means or how I feel like money doesn't change you. It reveals you. And so I want to be sure of who I am before that happens. And I'm not worried I'll suddenly be this terrible person or, you know, my ex-husband was a doctor and we did, he did, we, we weren't wanting for money and I had all of the nice things and I really enjoyed most of that. But I didn't like some of the attitudes in that. So I've had experience with abject poverty and experiences with having money, but not being real comfortable with the attitude behind it in my partner and figuring all of that out. So again, I would love to live grand in whatever way. I mean, we're minimalist. So for me, that looks probably different than it does to other people. Um, but yeah, I, I am afraid of what that would look like, I guess, or I don't know. Um, again, it's that black and white. I'm either here or I'm here and there's no in between. It's either a pedestal or I'm in the trenches, you know, there's no, and I feel probably it's the same. I'm doing the same with money and I have that survivalist mentality. Um, and I treat money that way. Because if I, if I need enough money to do something or get something or I figure it out, it may take some time, but I figure it out. But the bank accounts always brought back to $20. Right. You know what I mean? So, so when you think of yourself in uh, the area of money, uh, then tell me, how do you feel about yourself in the area of money? Unaccomplished. Mm -hmm. I haven't done well. Um, I'm good at managing it, but not at making what I feel like I need to make. Those are your thoughts when you okay. say those. So when you say those, what a can failure. I failure. Failure. I feel like I'm a failure. In when you say I'm a failure, when you say I'm a failure, before I say this, I want to ask you also, how do you, how do you behave towards yourself? when it comes in the area of money? Do you scold yourself? Do you punish yourself? Do you mm -hmm. cherish yourself? What do you do to yourself? I don't think I do anything to myself except allow it to create a lot of stress. Mm -hmm. uh, I make lists and that's, I make lists about everything, but I make lists about um, thing, the monthly bills are a list, the 
I set everything in priority, debt that I want to pay off, um, things that I want to be able to get, hiring a coach. Like, I mean, I have a list for everything. What do my kids need? What do I, you know? Um, so I guess needs, wants. So I default to numbers are very black and white. They're so it's not hard. You know, there's no reading between the lines. It's either there or it's not. So I make sure that I have it super organized so that I feel a little more in control of money. And I feel failure in not being able to bring in enough. It's the lack of money. It's a lack it's of. It's the lack of generativity of it. You don't, yeah. what is you manage well. The issue yeah. is you can't generate. Yeah. Um, yeah. So when you say to yourself, I'm a failure at generating, um, or the other one was also, I'm not deserving. Mm -hmm. two pieces I yeah. fail I'm a failure in generating and I don't deserve it when you say this to yourself what kind of emotion comes up unworthiness and when where is that unworthiness? I don't know because I, I don't understand that actually um when you say I'm unworthy what kind of emotion comes up um I definitely feel like it's a little kid thing for sure. Okay. Um, what emotion comes up when you say, I don't deserve, I'm unworthy, and I'm a failure? I think maybe that I'm inept or... That's also a thought. Okay. So when you say those, what kind of emotion shows up? Check your body. I'm sad and I'm tense. Okay. So where is the sadness? Where do you feel it in your body right now? In my chest and gut. And if, yeah. and if you could uh, number at zero, nothing, 10, the highest intensity, how much sadness do you feel in your chest and gut? A seven or an eight. Okay. May I ask you to close your eyes mm -hmm. and really pay attention to that area of your chest and gut and allow yourself to really feel the sadness. And even allow the sadness to go from seven to seven or eight to even closer to nine or 10. Just really experience the sadness. And allow the sadness with the muscles of your chest and gut, with the cells of your body in that area, to take you to the first time ever or the earliest time you've ever experienced being this sad. And that you told yourself, I failed. I don't deserve this. I don't, I'm not worthy. Now allow yourself to go through your body and allow the memory to come from your body. And whenever you're ready and you have a picture, an image, please share it with me. I was six years old. And my parents got a divorce and I thought it was my fault. And that if I had just done better. And I also felt like I wasn't worth it to them. And as you look at the six-year-old right now, what was she thinking about herself and feeling about herself at that moment? That I was unworthy. Mm -hmm. and that I just wasn't good enough I couldn't keep it together keep them together like somehow I had been bad or not good enough and it wasn't worth them staying together and it was somehow my fault and how was it your fault I have no idea you really thought it was I thought I had been bad somehow you held a lot of responsibility about, about this mm -hmm. and the responsibility was a lot and grand on your shoulders and how did you become so responsible at age six for their marriage yeah I have no idea <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's kind of dumb because 
obviously I know it was not, had nothing to do with me, but that's a logical statement. That's not how I felt at the time. Of course. It's, it's, I don't know. I think little kids just take everything on. Like they do. We do. And very much, yes, we do. And, and I felt like I was responsible for my younger sister. And I did I don't didn't even know what that meant. But and, you know, it just says you were so responsible from very, very early childhood. Yeah, I was very responsible. Yes. Yeah. I and I actually after that needed to be the one responsible. So so not only that, you sensed, you sensed something. Yeah. As you are six years old, you're sensing something that it seems like I got to be the grown up. I'm mm-hmm. the one to take this, right? Can you tell me how that feels. It's scary because I didn't know what I was doing and I did have to be the grown up. I mean, the divorce seemed like the worst thing at that moment. Certainly moving forward, it was not the the worst that we would go through and I did have to be the strong one and the responsible one and the keeping the shit together and figuring things that I it was me I did have to do that yeah. and you were a strong little girl mm-hmm. you were a responsible little girl and you were a strong little girl and you were yeah. doing the best that you could with all the skills you had and with all the control you could ever have to create what grown-ups were supposed to do. And I, wow, and it didn't work and it failed. No. And you took that as your responsibility. Mm-hmm. And I'm sorry for that. I'm sorry that you took that on. And my teacher at the time, I remember being in second grade and going to school and wanting to cry and she taught me very quickly that that would not be tolerated and so I also learned that I couldn't express how I felt yeah you had to keep it in yes and I learned that that very well to just hold it together and keep it in and so I'm responsible for the world yeah things that are out of my hands so I'm I'm set up to think I'm a failure because obviously I'm being responsible to, to things that are not mine. And then right. yet I also have to shut my mouth and hold my tears and hold it all in. It's shocking I'm crying this much. I mean, like, it's so unusual. Even I'm turning 50 this year and I was six then. And it's very, it's, it's hard for me to just be able to cry like uninhibited like this. It's, and thank you for that. Thank you for allowing yourself. Thank to you. Take it in this way. So, Jen, I'm asking the six-year-old, what do you need? What is it that you need? Because nobody's asking you what you need. As a six-year-old, what is it that you need? I need to be told it's not my fault and that it's going to be okay. And just to be seen for the six-year-old. I just want somebody to see me. Yeah. And understand that I feel like it's my fault I I just want that and I don't want to have to feel like I have to do it all by myself for everyone else yes oh, I need help <laughs> okay now I'm gonna ask you Jen the one who's 50 year old who's in okay <laughs> I want you to go back to the six-year-old. Uh-huh. I want you to tell her, I'm coming from your future. <laughs> and I've got good news for you. That I see you. And that it isn't your fault. And it was never your fault. And I'm telling you that you grow up beautifully and taking care of 18 kids. And even teaching the others. And telling her that the strange strength and responsibility, a sense of responsibility that she had even at age six, it's really paid off even in the future. Please tell her, give her the good news that she's not stuck there. That the world moves forward and the resiliency 
that you guys have, the strength, the sense of responsibility, that you succeeded bringing 18 kids, <laughs> raising them, and putting yourself in a place of having to share your world and success with others. And that now you go on stage and you share and you have a podcast and you go to other people's podcasts <laughs> and that you bring her creativity into the world. Please tell her. She is very excited. <laughs> Yes, she deserves to be excited. Now, what does she need from you? What does the six-year-old need from you <sighs> at this point? Um, I think just to continue being nurtured, really. You know, I she would like to sit on a lap and be held like I did to all my kids. You know, I think I gave them, I wanted to give them all the things I didn't have, but not in the way most people think they will. It wasn't about uh, cars or stuff, or it was about um, feeling safe and protected and nurtured and she, because that's what she wants. Yes. And since, you know, we could only do that symbolically and we can't actually right. sit on your lap. <laughs> How could you take care of her? How could you promise that you could take care of her so she will feel like she's sitting on your lap, although practically she can't. But what, what could you say to her? What could the gestures be that she knows that she doesn't have to be separate with you anymore? That she's inside you, within you, and a voice that you will always hear, and that you promise to see her, promise to hear her, promise to hear her needs. I think just to keep checking in with her and talking to her. Okay. Yeah. And what would her voice be look be sounding like when it shows up for you? Ah, um, wow. Well, I think it just did <laughs> with money, which was very unexpected. Um, she would be the one that just wants help and is unsure and is afraid and doesn't want all of the responsibility. <laughs> so I think when I hear her it's in those those thoughts and what does she want from you just assurance yeah to recognize that i see her and i'm here and it's gonna be okay because we made it 44 years you know past that time and really well for the most part and she do, it's so interesting because I think I was a great parent. One of the reasons that I was such a great parent is because I asked for help and I found resources. But I'm not very good at doing that myself or with myself. Yes. And I get very caught up in, well, I don't know how to do that. But if it were one of my kids, I'd find a way to do those things. And so just that same taking that same skill set that I already have and putting it in a different, yeah, okay. <laughs> so, yeah, so I think I'd have to take the skill sets. I do ex already have the skill sets and I develop them from that six-year-old and then I utilize them with 18 kids and then I pay them forward, but I don't, I'm not introspective about it. I don't turn around and do treat myself the same way. So when it comes to someone outside of you, you take your strength and you share it with them. Right. So now that the Jen, the six-year-old is inside of you and you will hear it as a fear, then okay. you will also share your strength right away and saying, don't worry, we got this strength. 
I know how to find resources. I have the skill set for this. I have the skill set for this. I know how to find the resources for this. You know, come along. I'll show you. Right. Give me your hand. We'll go together. And I'm here. And I'm here for life. And here on, we're, we're just growing together. There are going to be things we don't know. Right. And the same way we've learned so far. Right. Remember, I'm a master of survival. Right? Yeah. So I want you to check back with your chest and gut right now and tell me about the feeling. They feel really, really relaxed. Okay, good. Really yeah. relaxed. I hold a lot in there. From zero to seven that you had? Like a two, maybe. I mean, I... Yeah, I hold a lot in that space. Okay. And you definitely amped it up. Yeah, it feels it feels a little peaceful in there. I'm kind of enjoying that. Good. Take a deep breath. All right. So now I'm going to bring you back into the area of career okay. and money. Okay. Mm -hmm. And if you were going to be the invented self, Okay. With who you are, with all of you, with your strengths, your vulnerabilities, everything that you have. And you wanted to create a mission statement about you in your career and finances. Okay. Who would you say you are? I am in the area of career and finances. I am. Wow. Um... Um, hmm. Wow, I I have just hmm. throw it out in the area of career and finance. Well, career is easier. Um, I am compassionate. Um, I see you. I am driven. Um, I am unafraid to show myself. And if you could say that in a positive way. Transparent? Oh, yeah, very. Yep. Genuine, raw. Yes, I am transparent. That is, that's great. I love that. Um, I am successful. <laughs> um. I have built a skill set. And I I want to share it. And in the area of money, I am the invented self, a self that you oh. intentionally are inventing. I am successful, I am giving, I am I, I mean, I like my biggest goal is to be able to offer scholarships. The word know? that keeps coming up for me is prosperous. I don't know. Oh, that's a great word. That's a very happy word. Yeah, because it doesn't mean any number. Yeah, that feels very good. Prosperous feels very good. Okay, so prosperous and generous because you want to give. Very. That's a, that's a great way to sum that up. Yep. Compassionate, driven, transparent, um, uh, built with a lot of skill set that want to share, successful, prosperous, generous. Um, let's use another word for see you. What, mm. what comes up when you're going to see, like observant, maybe? Um, uh, observant isn't bad. Connected is very good. Um, okay, connected. Aware is good, but yeah, connected is good. I don't think any of them are quite right, but they're we're we're hinting around it for sure all right and yeah. and please after we're done take this week of yes. really like landing the words that yep. are you they're I'm, just you yeah and you know when you say it you like every cell of your body yep. vibrates and belongs to this yes that type of a thing yep yep i okay. feel that i totally feel that okay okay yep so so far 
with the words we came up so far is compassionate, connected, driven, transparent, successful, uh, prosperous, generous, and with a lot of built um, skill set mm -hmm. to be shared with the world. Yeah. Yeah. I know, I know anyone that isn't like vibrating will when I percolate on it. I think we're so close and some of them are great. Pick the one that's yours. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to use the word vulnerable. I love that word. Um, Put it vulnerable. Generous. I, I think that that is my favorite word because it's not just with money. It's with my skill set. It's with my time. It's with my compassion. It's with like generous and yeah, that one tenacious is a good one. But I love, I love the word generous right now. That's my favorite. Yeah. It means so much more. Okay. And when you say this to yourself, I am. Okay. And then you say all of those, what kind of emotion shows up for you in your body? like this really same place. I think my emotions must always show up in my chest. Oh my God. I need to pay attention to that. I, yeah. Um, uh, relief, excitement, enthusiasm, um, drive. Uh, see tenacious comes up again. Cause I think that that can be a really positive word. It doesn't have to be a survival word. It can be like, I just, I want to go and get, I, I feel like I've, blasted through a barrier and now I get to go. So I feel a little horsepower-ish right now, actually. So, okay. yeah. So, you, so close your eyes for a minute, go into okay. your body. From zero to 10, tell me the experience of excitement, enthusiasm, the tenaciousness, the generosity. Um, oh, it's, it's off. It's like 11. It's really, really big. Like I, f it feels very big to me. Beautiful. So just be with it. Yes. Rise and be with it. Now bring this vibration to every cell of your body. Okay. And then use with your hands a gesture that reminds you of this feeling when it vibrates that high every place in your body. Okay. Yep. <sighs> All right. And while you're doing this, mm -hmm. can I add just one more sentence to it? Sure. I deserve this. Oh, <laughs> okay. Do this and just... Okay, I deserve this. Yes, you do. Okay. Yeah. Okay, now check from okay. the crown all the way to the bottom of your feet. Anywhere there's a tension or anything going on? No. All right. Go. Great. So now going back to your career and finances. Okay. Now we're going to make it tangible. Okay. All right. So if you were going to make a tangible goal, okay, what would that be? Well, this week I hired a coach and I'm switching my website over. So I have all of this great support that I've paid for that I'm not afraid to use at all. And I need to really, really tap into that to help me do the things that I'm unsure how to do or that I yeah, don't understand. That's, that's the path to go. That's so the path to go. So what is the goal? For example, let's say oh. uh, today is May 1st, 2020. Right. Okay. Uh, what if we looked at, um, you know, May 1st, 2021 or 2022 okay. and what oh. would that look like? Um, totally different because I'll, I'll be doing, the thing I want to be speaking at women's retreats, even if that's virtual, because you know, it's May 1st, 2020. So we're living in COVID land right now. It's fine if it's virtual, but I really want to be doing um, women's retreats. I want to have in the interim, 
until I can travel for those, I want to be doing virtual retreats as much as I can. Um, I want to be actually doing the coaching, not on a beta testing group. And how actually, many clients would you like per week for your coaching? I only want 15 at a time and it's nine weeks. So I guess every two months it would be a new 15. I could do 20, but that's, I like connecting. So I really love the 15 ish. And how range. many virtual retreats per month? Or per um, well, that's travel. So that's family. I would rather do per year. I want to okay. do a half a dozen a year. So six it would be per year. six per okay. year. Yep. Beautiful. Yeah. All right. Now, um, earning by May 1st, 2020, what would be your earning? 2021? 2021. Okay. Um, my goal for a year is 10,000 a month. Beautiful. Now, um, now that we have this, then I would ask you to do action plan on it. Now, action okay. plans, there are a couple of things about the action plan. Um, so as you look at this, when you go in your calendar, my request yeah. would be to set up your calendar in a way that, um, for example, if your goal is to create 15 clients and six retreats for the next year and 15 clients per week, there are action plans that need to be happening every day okay. in order to create that, right? Yeah. So one of the things to do is to, first of all, um, take your calendar and uh, block off 15 hours per week for your clients already, regardless okay. of whether you have it or not. Okay. So you know that client is supposed to go in that hour. Got it. And then the rest of the week, you will plan out different pieces and then look at the retreats in realistically, if you were right. going to do six per year, which would be every other month, mm -hmm. uh, kind of like plan them where they okay. would be every other month. Okay. And then on the other side, every day with your coach, you would be doing something for, there would be hours that would be there for your marketing and there would be hours that would be there for course preparation. Mm -hmm. There are hours to be set for you taking care of yourself. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. you set those out in your calendar as an action item. Yep. Got it. Any questions? No, I have some of this already blocked off. I love the calendar. <laughs> yeah. No, no questions. I, I love setting it up that way. So. Right. And a bunch of it I already have set up. So that works great for Beautiful. me. Now, how was this process for you? Way more emotional than I anticipated. Because I, <laughs> um, I probably, prior to meeting with you, have done about 20. And they're all, I mean, they're completely different. So all of them are completely different. But they're all touching on stuff. So I choose different things. So, you know, I, I chose what we were going to kind of, um, I didn't expect it to go back to childhood. I, I did not see that coming and it was much more emotional and I didn't realize how long I've been hanging on to this. I knew that I had limiting beliefs and stuff holding me back. And I said that to you before we started like I but I don't know what it is or where it's coming from so I am blown away by that and I am shocked that I cried so hard it was like a switch the second you started saying something I thought oh my gosh this is a train I like I I'm not stopping this this is so I actually went with it but that was really really surprising and then you made it seem easy <laughs> You're like, so we're just going to move the pieces around like this and ta-da, like, you know, so it was very unexpected, the, very unexpected in a really good way. I'm glad. I'm glad. Yeah. I mean, so a lot I, of it. I'm also asking you to take on the skills okay. of to practice this every day on your own. This is okay. something you can do. I mean, I'd love it for you know you for you to contact me and talk to yep. me and I for me to do more. But I also want you to know that you have all the skills that I've given you, 
and you have that with, with the 12 questions of how do you think, how do you feel, how do you um, behave, uh, and what is the impact? Or how do you assume others would think and feel and behave towards you and the impact? And how do you think and feel and behave towards yourself and the impact? And then based on that, we found the core belief, the negative core belief. Right. And then together, we went to the emotion, we went through your body to the original. And we looked at the part of you that is there and is still needing something and is, and is there separated because it was holding to a false belief. Right. And that false belief was, it's my responsibility and I failed. And we took that and corrected it by reminding the little girl about the rest of you. So this isn't about, you know, me just any, either you or anybody else giving that part, again, false concept. We brought it into reality with actual strengths that you have. And you connected from another part of you and reintegrated those other parts. So you don't have to have inner children anymore because right. you're not a child. You are a grown woman with all of it inside. And you can have access to all of it. So the minute your vulnerability shows, your strength can show up immediately because they're all inside of you. And no parts of you needs to really be separated with you. And when you have access to all of you, then you get to, to reinvent yourself as much as you like every day. And you don't have to go with the automatic concept of the past. You can reinvent yourself every day because you get to say who you are and you get to put that out there and create result and the minute you create that result then everybody knows that's who you are because you just said this is who i am you acted as that as who you are and the world then gets to see you as who you are because that's what you just did so reinvent yourself every day however you like and then put your Put your act where your mouth is, uh -huh. and the world will see you the, see the result. And at Holy the end, you, know, you deserve this because it's all you. It's not something else. It's based on your own strength. It's based on who you are. And that's what's important. Thank and you. thank you. And oh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Fujan. Oh, my God goodness this was incredible thank you I, for allowing oh thank you for facilitating i i'm always grateful in the show notes it will reflect the fact that this doesn't post the day that we do it so i get to you know navigate through for a little bit and then also update it bridge the gap because um through sessions like these it's not a one and done like it this has that ripple effect it's not it's compound interest it's dominoes it's however you want to look at it and so this was amazing thank you so much thank you